All right, well, good evening. It's good to see you. Good to be worshiping with you. About 15 years ago, I was in college. I was playing in the band, so I used to play bass with the band. And then as the band got better, I did not, so I got kicked out. And it's okay. Uh, but I was, playing, I was playing bass in the band, and I wore a hat one time. And after the service, there was a couple people that just, they're not with us anymore, but they're just angry. Like, just, how could you wear a hat in church? How could you wear a hat on the stage? And so in that moment, as they were yelling at me, I decided, I said, you know what? Okay, I'm going to get rid of the hat. But one day, I'm going to stick around long enough to preach in a hat. <laughs> Tonight is the night, okay? So, yes, all right. I get to share this moment with you. Also, did you see Hayden's mustache? That was awesome. I just had to make mention of that. We were, we were at a charity golf event this morning, and uh, hence my just one shirt. And he was about to tee off, and he goes, Junior, should I shave the mustache before tonight's service? I said, Hayden, absolutely not. He's like, I don't know. My wife doesn't like it. I said, Hayden, keep it. And here's why. I tick my wife off all the time, and now I can just point at you and just say, but I don't have a mustache like Hayden. <laughs> so, I, you know, it's helping me out. So there's a, there's a saying in the business realm that clarity leads to conviction. So when you see clearly, you feel conviction. So if you're not driven, if you're not feeling conviction, you're not seeing clearly. Now, I don't know if you agree with that, but it did remind me of a few weeks ago. It had been a longtime dream of Nicole's to go snorkeling off, uh, on a reef off the Florida Keys. And so after our Easter services, our family, a few weeks ago, we, we, we ventured down to the Florida Keys. We boarded a boat with the kids, and then we, we floated out or drove out a few miles offshore, and we just jumped in. And it was incredible. I mean, God's creation is just, it was just amazing. I see life all around. But, but to be honest, I had more fun in that moment watching my wife. Not because she's cute, though she is, but her excitement, just like a child almost, like just shouting all the animals she saw. I was like, ah, girls, there's a parrotfish. Girls, over here is a barracuda. Ah, pufferfish. About 10 minutes in, though, my, my five-year-old, she grabbed my shoulder, and I looked at her, and her mask was filled with water. And she said, Dad, I'm done. Can we go back to the boat? And so bobbing up and down, you know, I cleared her mask, and then we, I swam her back to the boat. And we got on the boat, and I said, baby, you're not, we got to fix your goggles, otherwise you're just not going to enjoy this. You're just going to want to sit on the boat. And so, you know, we tightened the goggles, tried to fix it, get her hair out of the goggles, and we jump back in. I swim her out to her sister's. And as soon as I get out to her sister's, my middle child looks at me with water filled in her mask. And she says, Dad, I'm done now too. And my youngest look at her, and she says, yeah, me too, and her goggles have filled back up with water. And so I swam them back to the boat. My, my wife and my oldest stayed out in the water. And me and my two youngers, we sat on the boat. And we, don't get me wrong, we enjoyed the experience. They enjoyed the experience. But not like Mama. Mama came back on the boat just like beaming. She's on cloud nine. She's like, oh my goodness, I saw this and I saw that and I saw that. We're definitely coming back here soon. And it just goes to show that goggles really matter in an experience like that. Like if you can't see the beauty around you, you might as well just sit on the boat. And in a way, God has brought you and I to an adventure. Life is like a swim. God calls us to the depths to make a difference in this life, to take risks, to get out there, to dive deep, to leave our comfort, to impact eternity. And tragically, most people, they just don't see life that way. Most can't see God working all around them. Most can't see opportunity and potential that God has put right in front of their faces. Instead, it's like we all just want to sit on the boat, in our comfort zone, in our routines, in our same circles, taking no risk, not getting out there, not pushing ourselves, not growing our world, just sitting on the boat, floating around in our comfort. And much of it, if not all of it, goes back to the goggles that we have, the goggles through which we view life. Some of us are living with water in our goggles. We can't see the full beauty. We can't see much potential around us because our, our goggles are just filled with water. They're filled with comfort. We can't see past our comfort. We don't, we don't like the unknown depths of the water. You know, we just want to be around the same people doing the same exact thing. You know, can I just get on the boat and just kind of wait this out until it's over? But there are a few who live with clear goggles. We call them the goggles, the clear goggles of conviction. Goggles not clouded by comfort. Living with clarity, living with conviction to do what God has called us to do. To lead out, to impact, and to make a difference. And the reality is, we either live 
with goggles clouded with comfort or goggles of conviction. And the vast majority live with the comfort goggles. One could argue that according to scripture, 83% of people live with clouded goggles of comfort, while only 17% of people actually swim around through life with clear conviction. How did I get this percentage? In this text right here, we're gonna go for it. Numbers chapter 13 is where we're at. Numbers chapter 13, I encourage you to grab a Bible. It's page 121 in the Bibles and the chairs. Uh, we are big on scripture around here. We center around scripture as our final authority. And this is what brings us together is scripture. So we wanna be on the same page if we, if we can. Maybe you're new to scripture. You're kind of new to this whole church thing, Bible thing. That's great. We're just glad that you're with us. We got hardcover Bibles in the chair, like right in front of you. And again, it's page 121 in those Bibles. Otherwise, I know a lot of people use their phone tablets and they can look it up on there. Numbers chapter 13, we'll get into 14 as well. As a church, we're taking a time out really to kind of just regroup and consider the vision that God has given us as a church. Vision from God is a very precious thing and it's never something that we want to fade. See, the fact is we find ourselves living in a community that many people are fleeing. The Chicagoland area is often on the news and it's rarely ever for good. Seems like most have all but counted out this historic city full of potential. But we believe as a church that God has put us here for such a time as this. If we're here right now, it's for a reason. And we believe that for this city, the only hope for this city is Jesus Christ and his church. But for the kingdom of God to take more ground, it's going to require cost. It's going to require conviction. It's going to require clarity. And that truth is seen clearly in this text today. Let me pray and we'll just jump right into it. God, I do thank you for your word. And may you remind us really in this moment of the weight that we hold in our hands. That these, this word is from you. As confusing as it can often be, as maybe even politically correct as it can be sometimes, these are your words and there's so much depth in these words. And Father, I ask that we approach this, this moment for, with humility, submitting ourselves to the authority of your word. We ask that you speak. You always do through your word. So maybe our prayer is right now that we just listen. We tune out all distractions and really take advantage of this moment right now as we gather together as a family and hear from dad. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as the lens of scripture zooms in, we find ourselves in Numbers chapter 13, specifically in an area called the Wilderness of Paran. It's between Egypt and the promised land. See, the Israelites, having left Egypt as newly freed slaves, have wandered for years. They've just been in the southern end of the wilderness, and now they find themselves closer in the northern end, closer to the promised land than they've ever been. Though it doesn't feel like it, because this terrain seems like hell. The sun's heat is relentless, making rare, the rare shade priceless. Water is scarce. Everywhere you look is pretty much just brown. Any sort of green is definitely a commodity. And for some reason, Moses tells us to stop here. And we have mixed feelings about that. Our legs are tired from walking. Our family's exhausted from travel. Our belly's reminding us of the hunger that we bring with us. It feels good to stop, but come on, Moses, here. Is the heat got to you? Like This is where God told us to camp. Like right here, we uprooted our family and killed ourselves to get here. It feels like either the heat has got to Moses or God is just kind of jerking our chain right now. But too tired to put up an argument, us men, we set up the tents and the ladies work on what they have to put together some sort of meal prepping station kitchen area. The kids run around to and fro learning the new terrain. They were just whining about how tired they were moments ago and now they found some more energy and as the harsh sun sets, inviting a cooler breeze, we sit around fires as communal families. And across camps, word spreads of something interesting taking place. And Moses tells us here in verse 1 of Numbers chapter 13. It says this, As the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Send men to spy out the land of Canaan, which I am giving to the people of Israel. From each tribe of their fathers you shall send a man, every one a chief among them. So what God is saying here is that he wants one man from each 12 tribes. It's like, man, who do you pick? This is almost like draft day. You know, the, the tribes, they, they gather up. 
They select their representative, and on the appointed day, they send them to Moses. You just imagine this scene. There's old Moses. He's got his gray hair, his gray beard, the, the famous staff. And Moses, before Moses stands, 12 of Israel's best. I mean, these are like elite Division I guys. These are like full scholarship, full ride scholarship athletes. You know, the kind of guys that you trust behind enemy lines for 40 days. These are guys who can live on the run and live off the land. They have to be able to fight if need be, but they also have to be smart enough to go undetected. They also have to be trustworthy to bring back a full report of the scouting. Like these men, these 12 men are the pride of their tribe. They are the brightest, they are the fittest. And there they stand before him. The Moses, their stomach flips, their hands are sweating. Like this is the Moses, the Moses who stood before our, the Moses who stood before Pharaoh, the Moses who stood before the Red Sea, before our nation split the Red Sea with that staff. There they stand before Moses. And you can see in the following verses, if you have your Bibles in front of you, which I hope you do, in the following verses, uh, Moses records their names. 10 of which, 83%, you've never heard of. No names. Names recorded in the scripture, but all but forgotten. Because as we'll see, they'll have water in their goggles. But there are two names here, 17%, who live not fueled by their comfort, but fueled by their conviction. The two names, verses 6 and 8. Who are they? You can shout them out. Okay, Caleb and, Caleb and oh, so look at verse 8. Hoshia. Isn't that weird? Kind of weird, isn't it? Because it's Joshua. He, now, he will be Joshua, but at first it's Hashia. At least here in ESV, Hashia. You see that in verse 8? Hashia. And I have to point this out because uh, this is funny and yet, yet fascinating. So if you look at verse 16, this is so good. I love scripture. But there's Hashia. He goes before to meet Moses. You know, and Moses says, hey, welcome to the team. What's your name, son? Oh, Hashia, sir. And he says, mm, no. It's all in verse 16. He's like, no, uh, you're not Hashia anymore. You're, you're Joshua now. You're Joshua now. Why did he do that? It's not just a fun nickname. There's something to it. Hashia means salvation. And so there's old Moses sitting there thinking, mm, no, you might be the best, one of the best prospects, but you're not salvation, man. Like, that's a great name that your parents named you, but you are not salvation. No, son, you are now Joshua, which means Yahweh saves. You don't save, bro. Yahweh does. See, I love the beginning of Joshua's story here. Because here's a guy who takes a hit like right off the bat, right from the start, standing before Moses, stomach churning. Moses changes his name because he's saying, you're not that great. Your name is now Joshua. And Joshua takes it. He just rolls with it. And what's so cool is the greatest person who will ever walk this earth, Jesus, takes that name. Jesus is actually Yeshua, Yahweh saves. The first we see of the name above all names it's recorded right here. It's pretty cool. I mean, Joshua is humbled at the start, but one day God will go by a form of his name. That's pretty cool. But then old Moses lays out the plans. At the end of verse 17, it says, Go up into the Negev and go into the hill country. Now, if you're a visual learner like me, let's look at a map here, okay? So they, they start in the Paran wilderness, and they head northeast into the hill country. Uh, for those who have gone to Israel with the bridge before, this is the area where David fought Goliath, if you, if you remember that that area. We'll show a picture in just a little bit. We continue on. Verse 18. It says, and see what the land is. So go up in here, see what the land is, and whether the people who dwell in it are strong or weak, whether they are few or many, whether the land that they dwell in is good or bad, whether the cities that they dwell in are camps or strongholds, and whether the land is rich or poor, and whether there are trees in it or not. So the elite, Israel's SEAL Team 6, if you will, they get together, they drop the plans, they hug their wives and their mamas, their families, and they set out through the brown landscape. A couple days in the journey, the brown landscape begins to offer some green bushes. The next day, a little bit more greenery. Finally, they reach the hill country, and it's obvious, oh, we are now in the promised land. My friend actually used to live on, on up over just on the other side of, of this hill right here. In fact, uh, his daughter, my daughter's pen pal, uh, he named his daughter after this valley, the Valley of Ella. Uh, which is this valley right here, but just a breathtaking area, especially for these spies. You have to remember, after living their entire lives in a brown landscape, this view makes their jaws drop. 
there's full streams of water and vineyards producing larger grapes than they've ever thought possible. Like, this is unbelievable. The team looks at the exact same view, but they don't see the same thing. Most of the men's eyes are not drawn to the promised blessing around them, but to the obstacles that they see. Ten of the men look at the promised land with water in their goggles. They see the enemy, they see the risk, they see the obstacles, and yeah, okay, there's greenery and it's beautiful, but I kind of want the brownness of my safe camp. Two of the men, 17%, see the enemy as well, they see the same thing, but their focus is on the potential of this area. It reminds me of uh, that famous Henry Ford quote that goes, uh, obstacles are that, those things you see when you take your eyes off the goal. And that, that's what the spies, taking the eyes off the promises of God. And this, is what, this is what a lot of us do, right? Taking my eyes off what God has promised, and I'm going to focus on the obstacles. Verse 25 continues on. It says, at the end of 40 days, they returned from spying out the land. Verse 26, they came to Moses and Aaron and to all the congregation of the people of Israel in the wilderness of Paran at, at Kadesh. They brought back word to them and to the congregation and showed them the fruit of the land. So are you still in this scene? As the, as the, as the team comes into sight from the distance, word quickly spreads throughout the camps. Hey, they're back, they're back, they're safe, they're back, they're all there. And the mini homecoming kind of breaks out as people start popping out of their tents to go greet them. The team walks straight up to their commander, old Moses, with jaw-dropping produce like fruit that these tribes like had never seen before. And the dads throw their kids on their shoulders like, look at that food. In verse 27, and they told him, we came to the land to which you sent us. Yeah, God's right. It flows with milk and honey. And this is the fruit. And awe falls over the people. Like for a split second, this whole wilderness has seemed worth it. The sun beat days, the long travels, the hunger, the searches for water. Man, maybe it was worth it because look at that. And if scripture had sound effects, this is where you'd hear the screeching of tires come to a halt. However, the people who dwell in the land are strong and the cities are fortified and they are very large. And at that the wind is taken out of their sails. Oh, why'd you show us the fruit then? Because you got me all excited. It's kind of like um, young parents or parents in here, if you remember, you know, when you had like little kids. You ever try to plan a romantic evening after the kids are in bed? And it's like, all right, you know, you have that little window. It's like, okay, they're in bed. You know, you have that little window of like connection. You know what I'm talking about, right? Like cue the Nelly, dim the lights, that kind of a connection. And, and, and so you're about to, you know, enjoy each other. And it's like right then that you hear little footsteps coming. You know, those like romance sucking monsters are walking down the hall. They have awakened. You know, it's like, ah, the fruit was right there. But now I'm like going back to like read bedtime stories for the next 20 minutes. You know, wind is just kind of out of your sense. You know exactly what I'm talking about. I think this is the feeling that these people had in this moment. They just went from like excitement, oh, look at that fruit, to like devastation. Like, I don't even want to look at the fruit anymore because it's just a tease. Because there's no way we can go in there. So back to camp. Let's just get back on the boat. Verse 30, but Caleb quieted the people before Moses and said this, let us go up at once and occupy it, for we are well able to overcome it. Now, make no mistake, okay? Caleb is not some pie-in-the-sky guy, you know, Pollyanna. Oh, golly gee whiz, they aren't that big guys, we can do it. He's not that kind of guy. Like, he saw the same thing the other guy saw, but that was just an obstacle to the prize that God had promised them. And Caleb then tells them to clear their goggles. Come on, man, I saw them too, but this is our moment. Get out of the boat. Like, let's go take it. I think every family needs a Caleb. Very few have them. Every office needs a Caleb. Every community needs a Caleb. Every nation needs a Caleb. Israel here does not know what they have in their Caleb. Right now we live in a society starving for Caleb's. Verse 31 says, Then the men, so these are the 83%, the other 10 who had gone up with them said, We are not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we are. So they brought to the people of Israel a bad report of the land that they had spied out, saying, The land, though which we have gone to spy it out, is a land that devours its inhabitants, and all the people that we saw in it are of great height. And then if you look at chapter 14, skip to chapter 14, verse 1, this is what happens. So they go on back and forth, verse 1, Then all the congregation raised a loud cry, and the people wept that night. 
Can you see the tragedy here? This is a tragedy that most people live. For years, God has been working in this group. He's been freeing them from their enslavement, like many of us, right? God's freeing us from the enslavement of ourselves, of our sin. God has been working on this group. He's been prepping them. He's freed them. He's been guiding them through the sea. He's been sustaining them in the desert. He's been establishing their culture by giving them laws. Like many of us in this room, or not, not many, all of us in this room, God has been feeding them and guiding them and preparing them for, the, for this great moment, for this promised land. And they're about to throw it all away because... They have water in their goggles and they can't see past their own comfort. See, 17% want to take ground out of conviction. 83% want to shrink back out of comfort. Only 17% realize following God into the depths is absolutely uncomfortable. But come on, if you're always comfortable, are you really taking God's lead then? If you're rarely stretched, if you're rarely fearful, if you're rarely stressed... Are you really taking all that God has for you? Like bridge, and I, I'm including myself here, okay? So I'm just preaching to myself. Mainly I'm preaching to myself, and I'm just inviting, inviting you along. But as we talked about last week, we live in an area that most, not many, not most, many people are fleeing. I don't blame them. And if we're honest, many, many of us envy them. And I'm not saying anyone who has left our area is wrong. I have dear friends who have left, and, and I miss them, and I believe that God's going to do something great in their lives too. But my point is, is here we are. God has put us right here, right now. But yet, how easy is it, is it to lose sight of God's call? To take more ground in this broken area? To be a, a bright light in a very dark place? How easy is it to, instead of shining a light, just sit here and fantasize about our escape? Shrinking back out of comfort, craving safety, instead of getting out there and taking what God has for us? Like, will you be one of the ten or one of the two? Well, old Moses and old Aaron, they see something in these two young guns, and so they meet with them, Joshua and Caleb. And Joshua and Caleb and Moses and Aaron, they stand before the nation, and we pick it up in verse 7 of chapter 14. It says, the land which we pass through to spy it out, this is Caleb and Joshua talking, is exceedingly good land. If the Lord delights in us, he will bring us to this land, and he will give it to us. I love these young guys. He's like, let us get up in front of the crowd, Moses. Let us do this. Come on. See, Joshua and Caleb are two guys. I would just, I'd love to have his buddies. I'd love to have these two guys as buddies. See, there's a guy. I was just talking with some guys about this the other night. Um, it can be tricky to have, like, friends as guys, isn't it? I don't know. Maybe it's just me because I'm awkward. But, like, I, I've heard guys say the same thing. Like, it could just kind of be tricky as a guy to, like, make friends. It's just kind of weird sometimes. And I was thinking more about that. I think as a guy... Maybe this is true with women. I don't know, but I'm not a woman, so I, a woman, so I can't really say this. But as a guy, I feel like there are three levels of friendships. So, like, first off, there's acquaintances. You know, you work with them. You know, you see them at functions. And they're like a, a good, quick combo. There's, like, nothing wrong. It's just kind of how things have shaken out. It's like they're a good convo. The second level is, like, these are guys that you'd love to sit around a fire with. You know, they're good conversation. They're good hangs. Like, they're just they're good conversationalists. Then there's, like, the third level of guy or of a friend. I call them the guys that you would go to war with. Because you know that they would have your back. Um, they, you know that they would push you. They make you better. They would take the hill with you like they would take a bullet for you. Those are hard friends to find. Joshua and Caleb have found that in each other. It's like living with conviction. Like, all right, guys, let's, go, let's you and I go stand before a nation and tell them that we can go fight more nations together. Like, Israel has no idea. They must love these two. Verse 10, then all the congregation said to stone them with stones. So that didn't work out so well. Israel doesn't know what they have in these two, and they want to kill him. Now, thankfully, God steps in, not only saves these two from getting stoned, but rewards them. Uh, the 17% get part of the promised land. In fact, Caleb gets a mountain. So cool, there's another story in Scripture about Caleb. He's like, hey, I want that hill. Give me that mountain. And so Caleb gets that mountain. Joshua eventually takes the, the younger generation, the new generation, into the promised land. But this current generation, the 83%, the other 10 spies, they will miss out. Their water-filled goggles keep them from what God has for them. They stay on the boat. They stay in the brown desert. It's a tragic story. But yet what's more tragic is that's not the only time that's happened. This happens all the time today. 
I do it sometimes. God has a calling on you. He has a calling on your life. And he has a calling on your family. And he has a calling on this church. And that calling is related to our area. Most miss God's calling on their life. And it pains me to say it, but a lot of churches miss God's full calling on their church. Oh, we'll be well-intentioned, right? We love God. We want to embrace his calling. We want to do what's right. But sadly, most miss the full calling that God has in their life. And it makes me wonder if God is saying to any of us in this room, hey, you need to clear your goggles. Because I have so much more for you than what you're taking right now. But your goggles are filled with comfort. A few lessons from this text. To take God's full calling on your life. Number one, push past your fear. Push past your fear. Like, let's just be real. Joshua and Caleb had fear. They weren't stupid. They weren't uncalculated. They weren't like two guys overzealous just kind of shooting from the hip. They saw the men that they would be up against. They saw the giant fortresses that they would be up against. They had that pit in their stomach too. At night, they would gather around a fire with the other 10 and they would talk about, my goodness, how big is the other team? But at the end of the day, something won out in Joshua and Caleb. Their conviction not their comfort. And the same is true with us. Every single day we live, something wins out in you. Your comfort or your conviction. We spend so much time as a, as a Western society, we spend so much energy in risk mitigation. And some of it is good. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying we need to be idiots. Some of it is good. But our comfortable society has become almost obsessed with safety and comfort. Case in point, watch an ad. Next time you watch an ad, you know, before like Hulu or, you know, I don't know if you still have TV with commercials. Um, but marketers, if you watch like an ad, marketers really know us. They know that two things, top two things sell to people in the United States. Safety and amenities. Safety and comfort. If something offers more safety or more comfort, there is a lot of money to be made in our society. And it makes sense. But this can easily become an unstoppable freight train of obsession where our lives are driven by this. How much safety can I have in my life and how much comfort can I have? The problem is, as many then get to the end of their life, very comfortable and very safe, but they look back on a life marked with more of the same. That's the life I lived, like no risk, no stretching, no facing fears, no like total sacrifice of going all out for what God has called me to do. This is the story I'm leaving behind. It's tragic. But like this story, 83% die in the desert of safety, leaving little mark in this life. You want to take God's full calling on your life? Do not back down to fear. If you take God's invite, there will be moments of real fear. Like, ah, are we really going to give this much? You know, that, that stockpile made us feel really safe. Are we really going to commit to this venture? That extra time was a lot more comfortable. Are we really going to step out to step out of this familiar campus and add more faces to our small group? Yeah, I feel safe and I feel comfortable with these, familiar sa with these familiar faces. And God says, okay, I get that. But a greater story, your calling is beyond all that. The quickest way to surrender God's calling on your life is to back down from fear and embrace comfort. It's what 10 of the 12 did. Is that ever you? Because it's me sometimes. Uh, number two, to take God's full calling on your life, expect opposition. Expect that there's going to be problems. See, I wonder... Yes, I was reading through this story this past week. I just wonder, it's Joshua and Caleb, you know, they're walking back from the promised land with the other 10. Part of them is excited. Part of them is kind of like scared. But they're walking back to the other 10 with these images of like great cities and giant warriors that are still kind of shaking them and playing with their mind. I wonder if they knew in that moment, man, to take on God's promise, not only will I have to stand up against an opposing army, but I'm also going to have to stand up against my own. I wonder if they knew that in that moment. Because to me, I think this is true of everybody, but to me, when opposition hurts the most is when it comes from your own. You can expect opposition from the enemy, 
But when it's people that you consider your own, that's when it hurts the most. And this is what Joshua and Caleb are dealing with. But it goes to show, to take God's calling on your life, you have to press through the heat sometimes. If you're never opposed, are you really doing anything worth something? See, a major part of the Holy Spirit in us is the Holy Spirit firing us up with conviction. But I fear that too many Christians just kind of sit back when opposed. It's kind of like in the church I grew up in, um, there's a guy, he's a great guy, he's one of my youth leaders, great man. But there was something that he would say that would just kind of confuse me. He'd say, it, he'd say it quite a bit, but he'd say, you know, hey, if God's in it, it's going to go smoothly. Like, that sounds really nice, but like, where is that in Scripture? I don't see that in Scripture. What I do see in Scripture is when God opens a door, people have to fight through it sometimes. Like Scripture is littered with stories of God opening up a door and then the faithful having to fight their way through to follow God's leading. Like if we as families, if we as people, as a church, if we are really going to be faithful, and that's the cry of my heart, if we are really going to be faithful, we must expect difficulty and opposition. To accomplish what God has set before you, it's going to be a fight. And we have to be okay with that sometimes. That's this life. And that's part of the story that we'll one day tell when it's all over. See, the fact of the matter is, the peace of God does not come from cowering from opposition. And if you're anything like me, I can sometimes believe this. Oh, if I want peace, I just got to step back. I got to cower here. You know, dreaming of eliminating all conflict to just kind of enjoy the, the comfort of peace. A lot of times we can do this in our own homes, right? We just try to like sweep everything in the rug. Let's just try to smooth everything over. And then we just walk on eggshells all the time. Peace of God doesn't come from cowering from opposition. Instead, the peace of God comes from doing what he's called you to do. The peace of God is found outside of your comfort zone. When you step up, when you step out in obedience, pushing through the opposition to do what God has ultimately called you to do, to push, to lead, to do what's right when it's unpopular. It's in these moments of pain and hardship that we are met with the peace of God. You've got to remember, in this text, 10 of the spies did not experience the peace of God. Let's not forget that. 10 of these spies who wanted peace, that's why they gave the bad report, hey, we just want peace. They aimed for comfort. They stayed in the desert. They didn't get peace. They didn't see the battlefield, and they didn't see the glory of it. The 10 aimed for comfort and missed the peace of God. Two went beyond their comfort. They engaged in the opposition. They risked it, and they lived amazing stories that found the peace of God. If you're opposed, good. It means you're doing something. And then number three, you want to take God's full calling on your life. Number three, do hard things. Do hard things. If we're always doing the same old easy things, never really stretched, then we've eliminated what we were created for, dependence. You were created to feel dependent on God. This is why fasting is a, a discipline for the Christian, because we are to feel this dependence on God. We are at our best when we feel dependent on God. Do hard things. See, as a father, I, I, I feel like a big part of my job as dad is to push my daughters to do hard things, because I, I think God created us to do more with him than we often do. I don't want to raise, like, these snowflakes. I, I want them to, you know, be who God created them to be. I want them to be warriors. And so as a dad, I'm, I'm always pushing them with, within reason, usually, but pushing them to do something that they're afraid to do or they, they think they can't do. It's kind of like last week uh, before our Saturday night service. Uh, so I, I, I show up to church an hour early, like mic check, you know, check in with like the, the worship leader, talk, talk through things, all that. And then usually I have like a half hour to like study, to pray, to hang out with, with you in the lobby. It's, it's, it's fantastic. But last week I was, I was, I brought my girls though, and I was at a different location. We had 30 minutes to kill. So we're just kind of killing time, walking around the building. And my, my younger two, they found this ladder that went up to the roof. And they just like looked up the ladder and they said, whoa, we could never go up there. That's scary. I don't like hearing those words. So I said, well, uh, guess what, girls? We have 30 minutes, and guess what we're doing? We're going to go up the ladder. And after a lot of excuses and a lot of tears, we made it up on the roof. <laughs> and they got up on the roof. It was hilarious. They walk up. They thought they were on top of the world. You know, they were doing like the Simba thing. They were just, you know, they were having a blast. And they said, they said, I can't believe we made it up here. 
And as I helped them down, they were convinced, and this was my goal, they were convinced of two things. Number one, they can do something that is hard and scary. And number two, they can trust their dad. I'll do it with them and sometimes for them. But they can trust me when I tell them to step out and to step up. Our Heavenly Father does the same thing for you and I. He does the same exact thing for you and I. And this is, this is the Beyond series. He's calling you to go beyond your comfort. He calls you to go beyond what you think you can do. He's not calling you to take uncalculated, stupid risks. But he does call you to hard things further than what you could do on your own. Because it's in those moments of struggle when we realize, okay, I have God with me and I have God in me and I can do what he's called me to do. The truth is, some of us rarely see and feel God because we're not doing anything hard enough that forces us to feel dependent. And it's in those moments of dependence that we feel that. We don't see him because we rarely feel dependent on him. We're just too comfort, comfortable to see him. Vast majority, 10 of the 12, aim to ease their life. Keep their comfort, keep their circles, stockpile financial safety, rarely venture out of the comfort that they create, and they miss God. Two of the 12 aim for hard things, and God used them for amazing stories. Are you one of the 10 or one of the two? I love what Viktor Frankl wrote. He was a Holocaust survivor. He wrote this. He said, what man actually needs is not a tensionless state, but rather the striving and the struggling for some goal worthy of him. This is where God meets you. Man doesn't need comfort. He doesn't need ease. He doesn't need elimination of all conflict. No, God created us for the struggle worthy of a goal, and God gave us that goal. He gave you that goal. It is all around us. It is a broken and darkening community. It is hopeless neighbors, a community that everyone seems like everyone is fleeing and giving up on. The struggle and the striving are part of the story. Bring it on. Like maybe instead of condemning the seemingly God-forsaken city, maybe instead of dreaming of fleeing it, maybe instead of cursing it, we just decide, I'm going to be a blessing. And we do something rare. We do something special. We do something that echoes into the future generations. Maybe we take the full calling of God, we face the fear, we stand up to opposition, and we do something hard. Let's clear the water from our goggles. Let's get off the boat, into the water. Let's value conviction more than comfort. Let's feel that dependence on him. Let's take his invite beyond the ordinary into a story worth telling one day. So what? What about you? Where is God working on your heart? Because the fact of the matter is he is. As we read scripture, God always convicts, he always speaks. What's he putting on your heart? And we always ask ourselves a question, take his time for just corporate reflection because as a believer, it is so easy to read through God's word and then just go on with our lifestyle. We need a moment, we need some space to just let this sink in. And the question I want to throw your way is how are you going to step beyond your comfort? How are you going to step beyond your comfort? Because I believe that God has put a calling on the heart of our elders, on this church, to go beyond, to take more ground. Where is he calling you personally? For some of us, it might look like I, I need to start stepping up. I've just been coming and attending, and I haven't really put skin in the game. I'm not serving. I haven't jumped in. I, I need to do that. And for others of us, you know, God is calling us to make financial commitments. Say, okay, I, I'm, I'm going to financially invest in the kingdom, which is the best investment you could ever make, but I'm going to financially invest in the, ne in, in, in the kingdom in the next life. Where is God, how is God calling you to step beyond your comfort? This is a daily calling of God's, to step beyond your comfort. Where are you wrestling with that? This is just a space to kind of take care of that with God. 
to go before him, maybe make some confessions, make some commitments. We're just going to take this time of corporate reflection. I'll close this out in just a little bit.